Hello, hello everybody, we're Prokchop and we're back again with another Veritasium video. This is the man who accidentally killed the most people in history. Um, I'm like 50% sure he's German again. You know, maybe. One single scientist created three inventions that Ethanol? accidentally caused the deaths of millions of people, Ethyl? including himself. Not only that. Wait, why is he wearing Luffy's hat? I just noticed that from one piece. They decreased the average intelligence of <laughs> people all weed. around Let's the world, go. increased crime rates, and caused Damn. two completely separate environmental disasters that we are still dealing with today. Damn. And that's all before the age of 30. Probably not, but what have you accomplished in your life, huh? He's killed people. Part of this video is sponsored by Ren. More about Ren? them at the end of the show. What's up, Ren? In 1944, as a young chemist who had just finished his master's, Wait, Claire Patterson scary, yeah. went to work on the Manhattan Project, building the first nuclear weapons. His job was to concentrate oh uranium-235, the fissile fuel for bombs, from the much more common uranium-238. And this required huge machines, mass spectrometers, which separated the two types of uranium by their slight difference in mass. Mm. <clears throat> After the war, Patterson Europe went back to grad school to get his PhD. Wait, he picked a research. Wait, wait a goddamn second! This dude worked on the one on the first nuclear bomb, and he did not have a PhD. I mean, after that, do you even need a PhD? Come on. Project that would take advantage of his experience with mass spectrometers, measuring the age of the Earth. Huh. Radioactive rocks are effectively clocks. Uranium-238, for example, decays into thorium, and then protactinium, and then 12 more decays, until it oh, ends yeah. up as lead-206, which is stable. The rate of this decay is consistent and can be measured. Huh. It takes four and a half that. billion years for half of a sample of U-238 to decay into lead-206. Patterson's PhD project was to determine the age of the Earth by oh, measuring shows. the ratio of uranium to lead in primordial rocks. But to calibrate his instrument, first he used zircon crystals whose ages were known. Zircon is ideal for this purpose because when it forms, it contains trace amounts of uranium, but absolutely no lead. So any lead that you later find inside a zircon, you know must be the product of a uranium decay. Now, Patterson was tasked with measuring the lead content, and another student, George Tilton, measured uranium. Tilton's uranium measurements... So he went from building the atomic bomb to looking at rocks. ...were fine. They matched predictions. But Patterson's lead measurements were all over the place, and they were many, many times higher than they expected. We take George's uranium and my lead... Not right, Patterson. There was lead there that didn't belong there. Oh, so where was all this extra lead? lead coming from? That mystery would take over the rest of Claire Patterson's life and bring him to the literal ends of the earth. In 1908, Brazil? a woman was driving across the Belle Isle Bridge in Detroit when her car stalled. A pass in Detroit? Oh shit, oh shit. How many times did, get, did she get shot? The motorist sorry. stopped to help. In those days, cars needed to be hand-cranked to start. Cranked? He knelt down and ah. turned the crank, and the engine roared to life, a little too suddenly. The man couldn't Wait. get out of the way, and the crank handle Bruh. hit him in the face and broke his jaw. What? He died as a result of his injuries. What? Bro, that's probably one of the unluckiest ways to die, right? His name was Byron Carter. And he was the founder of his own car company. So he was well connected in the Detroit auto scene. Bro, please tell me he did not get killed by one of his own cars. Please. He counted among his close friends the founder of Cadillac, Henry Leland. Oh. Leland was so distraught over his friend's death that he resolved to eliminate hand cranks from his vehicles. Leland hired Charles Kettering to create a self-starting car. And by 1911, he had a working prototype. Nice. Hand cranking was difficult and dangerous, and best left to men. But a car that started. To <laughs> you can't have an ad like that anymore, can you? Changed everything. 
The world's first crankless car was the Cadillac Model 30. It was much more powerful than cars before it. It had a top speed of 45 miles per hour and 40 horsepower, double the Ford Model T. The Model 30 was a huge success for Cadillac, doubling the company's annual sales. Damn. But it had a problem. It was deafeningly loud. Oh. <laughs> In internal combustion engines, a piston compresses the fuel-air mixture, which is then ignited by a spark from the spark plug. The expanding hot gases push the piston back down. It's like a gun. The problem a with the bit. Model 30 engine was it compressed the fuel-air mixture more than previous models. So much, in fact, that often the fuel would spontaneously combust before the spark from the spark plug. So rather than orderly, perfectly timed explosions, you'd get multiple haphazard combustions leading to turbulent pressure waves inside the cylinder. The resulting sound led the problem to become known as engine knocking. Knocking wasn't just hard oh. on the ears, it hurt the engine's performance. It reduced power output and lowered fuel efficiency. The vibrations also damaged the piston and walls of the cylinder, shortening the life of the engine. The good news was that engine knocking could be corrected by changing the fuel. Different fuels can withstand different levels of compression before detonating. And heptane, for example, will spontaneously oh, we got combust the under only a little compression. Isooctane, on the other hand, can withstand a much higher compression ratio hey, before listen. it. Why are, those, why are the white balls smaller, huh? It auto ignites. Fuck you trying to so say, buddy. It's much less likely to cause knocking. To quantify how much compression a fuel okay. can withstand, scientists came up with the octane rating system. They arbitrarily set iso-octane to have a rating of 100 and n-heptane a rating of zero. <laughs> now, wow. real fuels aren't made up of only these two ingredients. They're a mix of lots of different hydrocarbons, but the octane rating tells you what mixture of octane and heptane gives equivalent performance. For example, 98 octane fuel can withstand the same compression as a mixture of 98% octane and 2% heptane. Now I'm going to take a little bit of 98 octane fuel and put it in this piston and when I compress it, explosion. nothing happens, which is exactly what you'd expect. This fuel can withstand a lot of compression. Diesel has an octane rating of 20, so it acts like 20? a mixture of 20% isooctane and 80% So it's going to explode. If I put a little bit of diesel in there, let's see what happens with the same compression ratio. It, ex it exploded. Hey, why didn't we do this in chemistry class? There you go. You get that a little awesome. explosion in there. That's because this is a low octane fuel. I mean, that's what diesel's meant to do. You compress it and it ignites. But you don't want this sort of fuel in an engine with spark plugs. The reason fancy cars demand high octane fuel is to prevent knocking in their high compression, high performance engines. Kettering wanted to find an additive which would increase the octane rating of ordinary fuel and eliminate knocking in high compression engines. So he hired 27-year-old engineer Thomas Midgley Jr. Midgley? Midgley experimented with all sorts of compounds, from melted butter and camphor to ethyl acetate and aluminum chloride. Melted butter? He later wrote most of them had no more effect than spitting in the Great Lakes. <laughs> Ethanol was an interesting exception. It did stop the knocking, but you needed a lot of it, about 10% of the fuel mixture for it to be effective. Hmm. That much ethanol would be expensive and hard to turn a profit on. And Midgley was really after an additive that was cheap, easy to produce, and effective even at low concentrations. So he kept trying. Then he hit on tellurium. tellurium? It worked wonderfully as an anti-knock agent, but it had a terrible smell. You couldn't get rid of it by changing clothes or bathing. Jesus. His wife was so offended by the stench that he had to she sleep him? in the basement for seven Bruh. months. Seven months? His wife made him a rat. Jesus, that's fucked up. Midgley wrote, I don't think that although this doubled the fuel economy, humanity would suffer this smell. <laughs> Well, now on December 3rd, 1921, prices, after know. five years of working on the problem, Midgley found what five he years. thought was yeah. the perfect solution. Tetraethyl lead. That's a lead atom right there in the center. This additive was exactly what he was looking for. It stopped the knocking, it Cheaper. didn't smell, it was cheap to produce and readily available. Best of all, you only needed one part in a thousand for it to be effective. In a call to Kettering, Midgley said, can you imagine how much money we're going to make with this? 
We're going to make $200 million, maybe Damn. even more. In those days? That's that like... is over $3 billion in yeah. today's dollars. Sheesh. Now, for his discovery, the American Chemical Society gave him the prestigious Nichols Award. Nichols? And they asked him to do a series of public talks. I've never heard of that award before. Nichols Award? Talks, but Midgley declined. He and Kettering right. patented the process for making tetraethyl lead, and they called their new additive ethyl. Perhaps so oh. it might be confused with another common additive, ethyl alcohol. They made no mention of lead. Then they teamed up with three of America's largest corporations, General Motors, DuPont, and Standard right, Oil those of guys New Jersey, exist. to form General the Motors, Ethel Corporation. Their marketing was brilliant. No man can look at the amazing record of accomplishment here in this research division without confidence that these men are going ahead with an eye to the future, looking for new facts and principles which will make things better and make life easier for all of us. Ethyl controls. Next time, get Ethyl. What? What? <laughs> Jeep off the road passing you. At the 1923 Jesus. Indianapolis 500, the top three finishers all used Ethyl. And the demand <laughs> for shifts. leaded gasoline took off. To keep up, Ethyl Corporation had to build a new chemical plant in New Jersey. But the project began terribly. Within two months of operating, dozens of workers fell Poison? ill with lead poisoning. Yep. Five of them died. Oof. To address the public outcry, Midgley held a press conference. Oh, now you and want there, talk? he poured tetraethyl lead onto his hands, and he inhaled it for a full minute. He claimed he could do this daily without harm. But Midgley knew the dangers. The reason he had turned down the public talks was because he spent much of 1923 in Florida, where he himself was recovering from lead poisoning. Oh. He didn't go wait, anywhere wait, near. Wait, 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 wait. How is this not illegal then? He knew it was poisonous, but he didn't tell people. I, I'm pretty sure that's illegal. His company's product, even if the he could help won't it. save you, asshole. Lead is dangerous even in small doses. It mimics calcium in our bodies, so there's no efficient way to get rid of it. And like calcium, lead can be stored in bones for years, meaning it can Damn. continue to poison the body long after the initial exposure. Holy. The organ most sensitive to lead is the brain. Lead breaks down the myelin sheath around axons and prevents the release of neurotransmitters. That's why common symptoms of lead poisoning are headaches, memory loss, and tingling in the hands and feet. And children are particularly susceptible. Lead exposure can cause permanent learning disorders and behavioral problems. And the dangers of lead had been known for hundreds of years. Already in 1786, Benjamin Franklin remarked that lead had been used for far too long, considering its known toxicity. You will observe with concern how long a useful truth may be known and exist before it is generally received and mm. practiced on. He would have been aghast to learn that nearly 150 aghast? years later, scientists planned to add lead to fuel. Doctors and public I health... Mean, they didn't say they were adding the lead, did they? Officials from MIT, Harvard, Yale, and the US Health Service wrote to Midgley and warned them against producing tetraethyl lead. They called lead a creeping and malicious poison and a serious menace to public health. Their concerns were dismissed. Huh. This model shows how just the right amount of fluid containing tetraethyl lead and dye is added to the gasoline. No one doubted that a lot of lead was bad for you, but how much harm could a little lead do? <laughs> just a By the bit. 1950s, millions of motorists globally were burning lead in their cars and releasing it into the air. Some of that lead ended up on Claire Patterson's zircon samples, preventing him from determining their age. In 1952, oh, he moved. Oh, that comes back to the start of that. Oh, so this was. Oh, to Caltech, God damn it. Where he built a new lab from scratch. Suspicious of environmental contamination, he tore the electrical cables out of the walls to remove the lead solder. He cleaned the floors and benches daily with ammonia and made sure that air was Ugh. always being blown out of the lab. To go inside, you had to wear a plastic bunny suit. With enough ammonia, something would have been blown. <laughs> bunny suit. Patterson basically invented the clean room. Ah. Inside that room, he turned his attention to the oldest rocks in the solar system, meteorites. 
All the original rocks on Earth had long since been destroyed by tectonic activity. But meteorites come from asteroids, which formed around the same time as Earth. They have just been drifting through space until they entered the Earth's atmosphere. So the best way to measure the age of the Earth was to measure the age of meteorites. Patterson measured five meteorites, each mm. with three different radiometric dating techniques, and he found they were all 4.55 billion years old. Wait, they were all that the same? That's It's within 0.15% of the currently accepted value for the age of the Earth. Wow. You know, before Patterson's experiment, people thought the Earth was a billion years younger. So Patterson had done it. He measured the age of the, the Earth. Earth. But he wasn't done getting rid of lead contaminants. Public concern about lead exposure had continued to grow. But president of Standard Oil Frank Howard pushed back, saying, we do not feel justified in giving up what has come to the industry like a gift from, a heaven, gift from heaven on the possibility that a hazard may be involved in it. So basically, Science I want my money for coding people that are dying from the poison. Scientists Fair funded enough. by the Ethel Corporation claimed that lead was a Hello, natural part of our environment and therefore not harmful to people. But Patterson wondered just how natural is, that is the though? lead in our environment? And he had just the skills to find out. Wait, is lead not natural? He began by measuring lead in the oceans. If it were natural, he expected the concentration of lead to be the same regardless of depth. But if lead pollution had increased recently, it would be more concentrated near the surface. Hmm. He took samples in the Pacific and Atlantic Oceans down to a depth of four kilometers. And sure enough, lead concentrations were nearly 10 times higher Sheesh. near the surface. Lead pollution was clearly recent, but when exactly had it occurred? Wait, can you tell when to it occurred? To find out, Patterson had to go to Greenland and Antarctica. Ice cores Bro. record the level of lead in the air going back thousands of years. <laughs> you look so cool with them glasses. The though. levels of lead in the atmosphere have been elevated for the last 4,500 years. All of it is due to human activity, mainly mm. smelting ores to make metal. You can see the rise and fall of the Greek and Roman empires, the dip caused by the Black Death in the 1300s, really? and of course the spike in the 20th century due to industrialization and tetraethyl lead. So what did this do to people? Well, Patterson looked at the lead levels in the teeth and bones of recently deceased Man, Americans. British? And for comparison, oh, he mind. measured the lead in bones and teeth of Peruvian and Egyptian mummies. Since they lived over 1,600 years ago... What kind of dominatrix shit was that guy into? Some BDSM stuff. Ago, they would have been exposed hey. to much less lead in their lifetimes. He expected to find modern Americans had about 100 times as much lead in their bones but results showed it was closer to a factor of a thousand. 20th century Americans had a thousand times Damn. more lead in their bones than their ancestors. What does that mean for us? Studies of baby teeth revealed that even lead exposure well below the level considered safe resulted in delayed learning, decreased IQ, and increased behavioral problems. Wait, were people way smarter back then then? Problems. And there is a, a broad consensus on the part of everybody except the lead industry and its spokesman that lead is extremely toxic at extremely low doses. A follow-up study showed that those with higher levels of lead in their baby teeth were many times... The portion of soldiers who did not graduate from high school certified according to their past exposure to lead. ...more likely to fail out of high school. As huh. a result of studies like these, the CDC's guidelines for the acceptable level of lead in children's blood dropped from 60 micrograms per deciliter down to 3.5. 3.5. And as far as we know today, there is no safe level of lead. So it's Globally, still bad if it's lead is believed to be responsible for nearly two thirds of all unexplained intellectual disability. Damn. According to a study published in 2022, Holy. more than half of the current U.S. population, that's 170 is million disabled? people, God damn it, they were warning us about this. Were exposed to high levels of lead in early oh. childhood. Those born between 1951 and 1980 are disproportionately affected. The authors estimate that in aggregate, lead caused a loss of more than 800 million IQ points. The world is less intelligent today because, because of, of lead, lead gasoline. But there are even more troubling correlations. How can we get more trouble? We dumb as fuck. 
the a the the, the people banging rocks together was smaller than us. God damn it. The U.S. saw a steady rise in crime from the 1970s to the because 1990s. Or because we're dumber. Then it abruptly declined. This graph looks eerily similar to a plot of preschool blood lead levels, just offset by 20 years. The obvious huh. question is, did kids who were exposed to higher levels of lead grow up to commit more crimes than they otherwise would have? You might think this is just a spurious correlation, but yeah. the same pattern appears in many countries, including Britain, Canada, and Australia. And we know there's a... Wait, whoa, 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 whoa. That, that does not seem like the crimes are, you know, reducing too much. Britain? Britain? Causal connection between lead exposure and antisocial or violent behavior. A study of 340 teenagers found that those who were arrested were four times as likely to have elevated lead in their bones than similar huh. demographic controls it's who didn't wild. have run-ins with the law. Now, this doesn't mean that lead is responsible for all of the increase in crime, but it's but it very likely responsible for some of it. Now, it's tough to estimate the precise death toll of lead. One of its lesser known effects is a hardening of the arteries, leading to increased cardiovascular disease. A study from 2018 found lead was likely responsible for 250,000 heart disease deaths per year Only in the heart U.S. Disease deaths? Assuming so a constant could be more. rate over the past century, that amounts to 25 million deaths in the U.S. alone. Globally, the figure may approach 100 million. Most of those deaths are due to Midgley's decision to put lead in gasoline, a substance he knew firsthand was toxic, but he did it anyway to maximize profits. And the problem is not over. Current estimates of deaths caused by lead range from 500 to 900,000 per year. A 2020 UNICEF report warns that one in three children globally, that's over 800 million children, have blood lead levels at or above five micrograms per deciliter. Damn. A lot of this lead now comes from batteries and industrial processes, but some is still due to Midgley's invention. Still? Now, after Midgley's success with ethyl, he was put in charge of another engineering project. GM wasn't just making cars, but also household appliances. Oh, God. And fridges had a problem. Wait, the two fridges? Most common gas You're gonna poison our fridges, bro? Come on. ...used as refrigerants were methyl formate and sulfur dioxide. One is highly toxic, the other is flammable. <laughs> Midgley was tasked with creating... So he was like, hey, let's combine them. Flammable and toxic. Safer let's go. Alternative. And in 1928, oh. he developed oh. a non-toxic and non-flammable refrigerant, dichlorodifluoromethane. GM called this new product Freon. And to Freon? demonstrate Freon's safety, during the unveiling at the American Chemical Society... He really loves doing that, doesn't he? Midgley inhaled a lungful of this gas and blew out a candle. Oh. In the following decades, Kick CFCs like Freon became very popular and were used as solvents and aerosols. The problem is CFCs are light and stable. When released into the atmosphere, they climb up into the stratosphere, okay. where they can remain for 50 to 100 years. But if a CFC molecule is hit by an ultraviolet photon of just the right energy, it breaks apart, releasing a chlorine atom. And this chlorine atom can then react with ozone, breaking it apart into chlorine monoxide and oxygen gas. The result was another environmental disaster, the hole in the ozone layer. With less ozone, Wait, he's, more UV light. Whoa, 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 he's responsible for that shit? Penetrates the atmosphere, what? increasing the rates of skin cancer and cataracts. Plus, CFCs are potent greenhouse gases. Per kilogram, they produce 10,000 times more warming than CO2. Damn. The historian John McNeil wrote that Midgley had more impact on the atmosphere than any other single <laughs> organism in Earth's history. And not a good one. An agreement to phase out CFCs, the Montreal Protocol, went into effect in 1989. The ozone layer is now showing signs of recovery, although it'll take many more decades to fully recover. Jesus. In 1940, at the age of 51, Midgley contracted polio and became physically disabled. So to help him get up, he devised a mechanical bed controlled by a series oh of- Oh god, what did this do now? It killed the ocean? I don't know, make the earth explode in 50 years? What did you do, brother? Ropes and pulleys. On November 2nd, 1944, while it using the contraption, him. he became tangled in the ropes and died of strangulation. Oh. 
Seems to, <laughs> Thanks to <laughs> seems to go about as well as his other inventions. The so. work of Claire Patterson, Damn. it became clear that the lead in our environment is not natural. Burning lead in combustion engines spread the toxic element across the planet, into the air, oceans, the snow at the South hey, Pole, and cute even our bones. Not Japan good. was the first to ban leaded fuel in cars in 1986, nice but other countries soon followed suit. Okay, but Gary still Algeria hasn't died. was the last to do so in. Hey, we did it! Yeah, Romania, you suck. You're slower than us. We won the race this time. In 2021. 2004? Wait. The so UN? Wait, wait. We banned it in 2004? God damn it, Bulgaria. Calculates that the elimination of lead from this gas saves so over a million lives per year and $2.45 trillion. Oh. But leaded gas is still used, by the way, in piston-driven airplane engines. That's now the largest source of lead emissions into the air in the US. Why? You will observe with concern how long a useful truth may be known and exist before it is generally received and practiced on. What? What do you mean? You just gotta kill like 10 million people. Or was it 100 million? Eh. <laughs> That's so scary. Bro, that makes you think. What other things are people gonna discover that are gonna be extremely dangerous to us after we find that out in like 30 years and we've killed ourselves? Jesus, this is... this. I'm gonna be honest with you. This video is terrifying. It is actually terrifying. Well, now that we are a little bit more scared and we have an excuse to be stupid, I hope y'all enjoyed this. Quick thank you to YouTube members and Patreons. And I hope y'all have a nice day. Bye, everybody.